significant? How do we live a life that matters? What does it mean to be counted as significant in God's kingdom? That's what, that's what we've been talking about, Pastor Brian and I, for the past few weeks. He's presented a few sermons already on the subject. Are there educational requirements? Do you have to look a certain way or have a particular personality or an advanced degree? Does your family history matter? Does your age, your appearance, or your IQ impact your significance in the kingdom of God? What does a person who is living a life of significance look like? Can you recognize them? What do they do? How do they act? What is the underlying character of one who's significant? And we're talking about significance in the sense of someone who has dedicated their life to the Lord. Those who say they're Christian, those who say that they've surrendered their lives to the leadership of Jesus. And if you haven't done that yet, we're still really happy that you're here. Or if you're watching on live stream, we're very happy that you've tuned in. Because significance, you're already significant. But what we're talking about is after you've made the choice to become a follower of Jesus, what does it mean to be significant in the kingdom of God? Last week, Pastor Brian said that we've been given a name, a name that matters because it's God's name and we take his name upon us. We carry God's name and God's reputation with us into the world wherever we go. And today I want to talk to you about how we carry God's name into the world. And I'm going to answer this question. What type of people or person is God looking for? Someone who is capable of living in the kingdom of God and making an impact that is significant. So those of you who are business owners and, um, and you hire people, if you were hiring someone today to fill an important position in your company, what would you be looking for? Whether you're looking for an administrative assistant, a marketing executive, a nanny, a school teacher, you probably have a, like your top five things that you look for when you're hiring a good employee. Maybe it's their education, experience. Maybe they have a strong work ethic, leadership. There's a whole variety of things that you could be thinking in your mind right now. Yes, that's what I look for. But when God is looking for someone to do something significant, what type of person do you think that God is looking for? Is there a job description somewhere out on the internet where you can search for, and then there it is, God has his job uh, assignments, and, and you can submit your resume to that. And if there was, what would you think? How, what would you submit? What resume do you have? Let's pray. God, the question rings in the air. Who are you looking for? Lord, I pray that in these moments that we have that we just supernaturally focus on you and that your word is transported into people's lives and ears and their hearts and they're open to what you're saying to them, that there's nothing that prevents people from hearing you in the next few moments. And may your will be done, Lord, in this church and through these beautiful people. Lord, here we are. We're listening. Amen. So there was a king in the Old Testament who was chosen to be the very first king of Israel. Does anybody know who that was? His name starts with an S. Saul. Saul. I heard it. Yes. So Saul was tall, he was a military leader, he was a religious man, he had a really good family, and Saul had been the king that, uh, for several years in the story that I'm going to tell today. Saul um, had, been, had led many military battles and had won, and he had done a lot of great things, and the people were following Saul with no problem, but, at, but God was, was not happy and pleased with Saul because God had not, or uh, Saul had not followed God's instructions. And as a result, God was looking for Saul's replacement and God told Samuel, the prophet, to go find Saul and tell him the job requirement that would be for his replacement. 
which is not what you really want to hear when someone's telling you that they're looking for your replacement. And by the way, here's the job description. <laughs> but that's what happens. So we're going to look at that right now. First Samuel chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. Here's what it says. How foolish, Samuel exclaimed, and he's speaking to Saul. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Had you kept it, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom must end, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So what he's saying, God is saying nothing about education, experience, proven track record for leadership, and kingly success. He didn't even say that prior experience was necessary. You see, God was looking for one thing and one thing alone. God was looking for a man after his own heart. And you might be saying, well, what does that mean? Well, that's what we're going to talk about. God was looking for something that ran deep below the surface. God was looking for someone who would operate out of their godly character and be motivated by God's love. God was looking for someone who was aligned with his own heart, who would care for his people like he cared for his people. And today we will peer into the life of a young man of David who wasn't trying to become a king, but was found by God because of the qualifications of his godly character. So if we go and we turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16, Saul is king. And when God sends Samuel the prophet to find the family of Jesse, that is the father of David, Jesse has actually eight sons. I think the last service I said seven. He has eight sons. And God was going to anoint one of his sons to be the next king. And you heard Bill read about that. So I'm just going to pull a couple excerpts from that passage of scripture and kind of review them. We know that in verses six and seven, when they arrived, that Samuel, when he looked at Eliab, he thought, this is the Lord's anointed. Like he looks like he is going to be a king. He is not only, he doesn't, he has the look of a king, but he also has the qualifications of a king because he's the eldest son. And that held a really specific role in the family. But the Lord said, what? Don't judge by his appearance or height for I've rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So it, it's clear that that this was not going to work. Like what Samuel the prophet even believed isn't what God believed and not what God was looking for. So Samuel continued down the line of all of the brothers and went through all seven brothers. And finally there came a point when God had not spoken to Samuel and said, this is the one yet. And finally he said, you know, he's listening for God's confirmation. And Samuel says, Jesse, do you have another son? Because I'm not hearing from God right now. And this is what Jesse says. He said, yes, they're still the youngest, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep. Send for him at once. And Samuel said, we'll not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. And then Samuel returned to Ramah. So how many of you are the youngest children in your family? Raise your hand. There's a lot of you. Well, I'm one of the eldest, and I think you're all brats. <laughs> There's this thing, right, that, that the, the youngest child is perceived to be the spoiled one, the one who's favored by the parents, who gets to do whatever they want to do. Maybe the parents even, like, back off a little bit, and, you know, the, the young, I know, I know you all. Like, I'm the older one. I know what it is. Of course, the younger one is saying, you guys treat me like garbage. I had to claw my way to get anything I ever wanted. And uh, I was thinking about my family. So I was the, I had an older brother, but then I had two younger sisters. And we had to share a bedroom. So let's just say it didn't go very well. And, but since I was the, the oldest daughter, I decided that um, I have authority. So I get to make the rules. And rule number one is I get 50% of the closet and you guys can figure out the rest. And I also get 50% of the dresser. And if any of your stuff gets on my half, I will throw it on the floor. Oldest children, do you agree with that? Yeah. Thank you. Somebody has to control what's going on here. 
So imagine how David's brothers felt. You know, David's older brothers, as they waited for their youngest brother to come in, and they knew that Samuel was not going to say that he was the anointed one. There's no way that Samuel was going to pick David. He would have been smelly and grubby when he came in, and they would have waited to see what Samuel would say and do, waiting for Samuel to go, don't you have another child? But that's not what Samuel said. Samuel said, this is him. Anoint him. And all of his older brothers heard those words and saw the oil poured upon their brother's head. But they all knew one thing for sure, that David was not qualified to be king. He couldn't be qualified to be the king. Here's what I want you guys to hear from me. If you feel like you aren't qualified to do a work in the kingdom of God, then you're just who God is looking for. Because the first qualification to be significant in God's kingdom is to be an ordinary nobody. Before David became king, before he became king, right? He was an ordinary nobody. What do I mean that? Well, David was literally, think this through, he was the last one who came to mind when anyone thought of someone who was going to become someone significant. His father didn't think it was him or he would have had him there with all the rest of him. His brother certainly didn't think that it was going to be David. And even Samuel the prophet didn't think it was him. Remember, he thought the eldest brother would be the one. He looked the part. David was literally everyone's last pick. And I don't know if you notice this or not, but there was a a sacrifice that was getting ready to take place. A religious celebration was getting ready to happen in the presence of Samuel the prophet with the whole family. And who's the only one who was missing? David. He was out caring for the sheep. He was not even important enough to call in for that special moment. To them, David was nothing special. He was ordinary. Maybe he was even a nobody, but not in God's eyes. Why? Because job requirements to God are different than everyone else's. He looks at the heart, and David had spent years alone with God. Imagine caring for sheep, taking aim and throwing rocks at things, getting better and better as you go along, playing music, writing, writing lyrics to beautiful songs, looking at the stars, talking to God, but he was alone with God. That's when he developed this incredible relationship with God and he began to trust God. And David didn't even know it, but he was developing the character of a king. Sometimes when we feel like we're nobody, sometimes when we feel like we're alone, that's exactly when God is forming our character. We are with step, in step with God, with God, doing what God wants. And we feel like we're just isolated, but God is there doing something in you. Remember the psalm that he wrote, all of us know this. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation, and you can read along with me. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. And even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect me and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. These are the words of a young man who knew God. David's heart and God's heart were one. Their thoughts were in alignment. David delighted in God and God delighted in David. And this happened in the solitude, in the moments when no one else was there. And the only thing he had was God. David was already living a life of significance because he was a man after God's own heart. And nobody else noticed, but God knew. God knows, by the way, he knows all of your hearts. 
He knows all of those things you have in your mind and how you feel about him and, and he's wanting you to understand who you are and whose you are. Number two, before David became king, he never pushed his personal agenda. These characteristics of someone like David, we can really learn from. I have learned so much from his life. Most commentators believe that it was about 15 years from the time David was anointed to the time he became king. So realize that David was handpicked by God, anointed with oil in front of his brothers. He was told by the prophet Samuel that he was being anointed as the king, which means you are the king. <laughs> you are the king, except there's another king that's in the palace. For 15 years, there's another king in the palace. There's another king who's in control. I'm not totally sure why God left David and his family. Remember, there would have been pressure, like, the brother is going, uh, I don't know who you think you are, but you're not king in our minds. But David was anointed, but not actually the king. And so I think if I was David, that my pride probably would have kicked in. And I would have been saying things like, hey, uh, God, when's Saul going to be out? You know, didn't you tell me back in? <laughs> Isn't that? And then, or maybe, um, you know, it's been a couple years now, God. Don't you need my help? You want me to help get him out? Because I can. God, why don't you just let me off him? You know, I've, I've taken care of some lions and bears out in the wilderness. I can take care of. Um, did you really anoint me? Am I, did I misread what happened back there? Am I really supposed to be? Because sometimes we hear God call and and we think we're supposed to move into some kind of phenomenal leadership role right now. And we, and we sense God's presence, and, but then we all of a sudden wonder what happened. Did I really hear from God? I used to have a friend who I used to sing with, and she would always want to know why. She's like, I'm a singer. God's called me to sing. I should be singing in churches all the time. Why aren't any doors open? And she kept trying to force God's hand. I'm like, that's not what the way it is. It's called faith. You're supposed to trust God. You, God. God doesn't tell you a little something and then you take it and go, well, I'm gonna make this happen. That's not how it works in the kingdom of God. It's just not how it works. That's not faith. Faith sits back and waits on God. Faith continues to love God while we're waiting. People of kingly character and pursue God with their entire heart remain in a posture of humility and worship instead of feeling like God has abandoned them. God is in control. You are not. Sometimes the very thing that God promises us becomes our greatest distraction from God and we lose sight of the dream giver because we're focusing on what we believe he's promised to us and the dream that he's given. But I love what David did. What did David do? David just said, okay, I'm anointed. Uh, I work for my dad and I'll be out with the sheep. So he goes back and he starts tending sheep. I love that. He felt no pressure to make anything happen. And what's even more interesting is at the appropriate time, David was invited to serve the king. So not only, he, he's not there to become the king, he's there to serve the king. So what happened, if you know the story, Saul was really stressed out and had some issues and he was dealing with depression and fear. And what do you do when you're dealing with depression and fear? You call a harpist? I don't know, I do. <laughs> Call in the harpist, but, but that's what he wanted to do. And who's the greatest harpist in all of the land? David. Oh, that's funny. So now David goes in and he's in the presence of the king. He's not king yet, but he's in the presence of the king and he starts playing the harp. So now he's in the kingdom in the presence of Saul. Here's what the Bible says in, in chapter 16, verse 19. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse to say, send me your son, the shepherd. Jesse responded by sending David to Saul along with the young goat, a donkey loaded with bread and wineskin full of wine. So David went to Saul and began what? Serving him. And Saul loved David very much and David became his armor bearer. And sometimes God calls us to serve the one that we're going to replace. I mean, it's very weird. 
So David, who had been handpicked and anointed as king, now had to serve the current king who he was going to replace, but he never, not one time, tried to push his way into a position of authority. He remained humble. He trusted God, and his kingly character was noticed by all. You see, his character was being developed before he ever became king. And the Bible says in chapter 18, verse 5, whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him a commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. So before David became king, he didn't need to push his personal agenda because he was already living a significant life. He was a man after God's own heart and God saw him. Number three, this is for all of us to understand. I mean, all of these are personal application to our own lives. And by the way, if you're a woman, you don't get out of it. Just because I'm saying a man after God's own heart, it's a person after God's own heart. And these are the characteristics. I just pulled a few out of his life that I think are super significant and have impacted me. Number three, before David became king, he treated the current king with respect. So think about this. David had the spirit of the Lord upon him. People began to see David as an amazing leader. Even though David was not sitting upon a throne and living in a palace, he was beginning to operate in his calling. And that is when David came under attack. So Saul, who used to love David, became David's biggest enemy. So hear me when I say this. When you begin um, operating in the spiritual realm and you begin understanding what God is calling you to and you're stepping into your significance in the kingdom of God in whatever role that is, that some people may begin, begin to feel a little bit weird about it. So I know this because when I began stepping into my call years ago as a worship leader, I remember I went to my best friend's house and I sat down in her home. She didn't know why I was there. I said, I need to talk to you. I said, I think God is calling me uh, to be a worship leader and, I, and calling me to take a position in this church, and I thought she would say, that's the greatest news, I'm here for you, yay, and it was the absolute opposite, and I mean opposite, and she opposed me, and she started yelling at me, and she would go to church, and she'd tell everybody that I wasn't qualified for the job, and she would call me every day on the phone and tell me what a horrible person I was, and I shouldn't be doing this, and it was awful, I'm like, why is this happening? I've never even, why are you mad at me? I, I literally didn't compute what was happening. But I look back and I know what was happening is that God was putting me into a place where he wanted me to be and it makes other people feel uncomfortable. A lot of times it makes people feel insecure about their own role in the community of faith and so they get defensive about it and get angry about it. Have you probably heard people say that hurting people hurt people? Well, I was being hurt, and I felt like I had spears being thrown at me every single day. And even though Saul tried to kill David and spoke evil of David, David never once tried to force Saul out of the kingdom. How you respond to that kind of thing is, will show you where are you a person of godly character or not. One of my favorite stories takes place in 1 Samuel chapter 24. Um, and Saul was just on a rampage. Like he was going to kill David. He was looking to kill David, who he used to love. And he'd been trying to kill David now for years. And David had been in hiding and he had a few men who were following him now. And he ends up um, in this cave and he's hiding in the back of a cave. And Saul and all of his elite troops decided to break from their pursuit of David and, and they needed to take a break. And it's funny how things work out. In 1 Kings, I'm just going to read it to you. It says this. It says, at the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. I did not write that. I'm just telling you what the Bible said. <laughs> So he's in this cave relieving himself. But as it happened, this is the best, that David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. Da Now's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into power to do with as you wish. 
So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. I would have been like, yes, you're done. No, he gets a piece of the hem of his robe. And this is what blows my mind. It says, but then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord, the king. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. His men were saying, this is what, this is God's will. You're supposed to kill Saul. But David respected the position of authority that God had put Saul into. And therefore, he would do nothing to hinder God's anointed and God's leader. This bit of scripture for me has completely, over the years, changed my entire life. How do I communicate to those in positions of leadership and authority? How much David must have loved God to allow his enemy to walk away unscathed more than one time. He did it multiple times. Before David became king, he didn't need to speak evil of the current king because he was already living a life of significance. He was a man after God's own heart and nobody else noticed but God saw and someone who is a person after God's own heart can get through anything and they don't have to be negative and they don't have to be trying to force their way into something. You don't have to do that because God is on your side and David knew that. You see, before David became king, he walked and he lived as a king in God's kingdom. And that's when God put him in the position of authority. God is looking for people who have kingly character. He's looking for those who turn the other cheek. He's looking for those who don't gossip and speak negatively. He's looking for those who don't try to push their own agendas or further their own reputations. Those who wait on God to put them where he wants them to be. He's looking for people who act a lot like Jesus. That's who God is looking for. And if David could live that way years before Jesus was ever born and depend upon God for everything, I think the least we can do is take a note of what David did and how he lived. I made a, a list of the attributes of King David and if he had a resume, what would his resume look like and what would be on it? And it's for an ordinary nobody, which is me. I could relate to that word because I'm not qualified to do what I do. God qualifies. So the objective is to have a life that matters by serving in the kingdom of God and making a significant impact on eternity. And the experience that's required, well, I'm doing my best to love God fully with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. I'm spending time with God, enjoying God's companionship, and doing life with other people who also love God. I'm beginning to sense God's presence, realizing that God is not far away, but is more like my friend. I'm learning to trust God and realize he is present with me, providing for my every need. God is more than enough for me, and I am content. And the education is school of the Holy Spirit through time spent with God. And then if you go down, and I'm not going to go into it right now and read the personal characteristics, these things have been pulled out from David's life before he ever became king. And you can take this home, and if you want to be a person who is significant in the kingdom of God and makes an impact and puts God first in everything, when you fully love God, he will do amazing things through you. 